Oh, hey there. My name is Landon Huber, and I'm an illustrator, a musician, and a comic book artist. I also do surrealist painting. And welcome to my third art process video. I'm excited to show you my creative process today. Today, I am going to be drawing a picture of a creature that lives deep in the Amazon jungle. An ancient monster from a bygone era. The last of its kind. From a species half man, half fish. A giant amphibian-like creature with the ability to breathe both underwater and on land. A creature who shuns the light and prefers to live in darkness. Today I will be drawing the creature from the Black Lagoon. The creature from the Black Lagoon was first unleashed in the movie theaters to an unsuspecting public in the cold winter of 1954, and it was released and projected in polarized three dimensions. And for the unknowing crowds who witnessed the creature, it was even more real than their own realities. The creature from the Black Lagoon became a classic film and would later spawn sequels, books, comic books, Halloween masks, artworks, and would be forever cemented and the long-standing, undying legacy of the classic Universal Monsters. Today, I will be changing things up slightly from my first two art process videos. First, I start off with a thumbnail sketch, crude and basic. Then I'll do the penciling and the inking, but instead of coloring with watercolors, I will be coloring using a combination of acrylic inks and paints. I will be creating the art on a sheet of 11 by 14 300 series Strathmore smooth bristle board. So thanks again for being here. This one was a fun one for me and I hope you will enjoy this video of me drawing and creating the creature from the Black Lagoon. So Without any further ado, let's begin. And so for this one, this is my basic thumbnail sketch. And um, I know that I want him to be kind of crouching and dripping water like he just came up out of the swamp and in the foreground I'll have some uh, some trees and foliage in the foreground and background and uh, so this is it this is how I'm gonna start the picture that's all I need to to get going so let's see how it turns out <laughs> So, the first thing I usually do when starting any drawing is usually the head. After I see the head, in proportion to the size of the paper, it gives me a pretty good indication of how I want to make the rest of the body proportion to the head. And then I just go from there. But as I draw, I'm trying to think of this as a three-dimensional shape, three-dimensional forms. There's forms that go back in space, there's forms that come out. And as I'm first constructing these basic shapes, I'm thinking of all those things. It's important so your drawing doesn't end up looking flat. Also, uh, in a drawing, it's important to keep in mind not only the things that you are drawing, 
but also the things that you aren't going to draw. So you ha if you have an arm going back in space or behind the pectoral muscle or what have you, then you're not going to see parts of that. And if you try to draw it all in there, it's going to look wrong. So you need to keep in mind what you aren't drawing as well. And uh, as you can see, I'm already roughing in my basic placement of the shadows, which is important. Um, you want to have a good idea of where the shadows are going to be really from the get-go. Drawing the drips from the hands. I want to give the feeling like he's emerging from the water. Things are dripping and falling off of him. Pieces of the swamp and water is dripping. Drawing the scales. start to add a little bit more detail into the face. Um, keep in mind that the, this is really my version of Gilman. I'm not trying to really just recreate the, exactly the way he's he looks. Like the guy in the suit look, you know. I'm trying to put my own spin on things. So there's going to be certain things I change to uh, make it more mine, I guess you could say, more my my version or my vision of, of Gilman. And I'm just going in, um, laying in the background and uh, the environment. I rough in like where I, I had the idea, oh, I'm, maybe I want a little frog right there. And I'm very quickly just uh, putting in things, you know. As as I'm thinking, uh, as I'm looking at the picture, I'm trying to get inside of the picture and make it come to life in my mind. And um, the more I, I stare at it, the more that, that starts to happen. So really, I'm not even thinking of this at a certain point as drawing or as lines on a paper I'm, I'm trying to think of it as something as a as a scene from a vision I'm just uh, doing the detail you you really have to uh, as you look at it uh, kind of kind of plot out where you're gonna put the little shadows and where you're gonna put the, um, the scales and, and things and the little places in the body where it uh, there's little divots and little creases and, and textures Every, everything you draw, every line, every shape you, you draw really changes it, so you want to try to be aware of that. Sometimes I just look at things and try to study the way that light falls on it. It's actually a pretty complicated thing, um, but, you know, as I'm getting older, I'm hopefully getting better at doing that. Um, but then at the same time, there's certain decisions you just make graphically. And that's where I kind of, you know, you really have to decide, what am I going to draw this making it with a graphic decision or am I going to draw it to make it more you know a 
of how light would actually be hitting this or falling on this, you know. And it's kind of a combination of both. Sometimes the best graphic decision is isn't going to be exactly the way that it would really look, but you do need to be careful about making those kinds of decisions because you could end up making uh, your picture look unbelievable, I guess, if you, if you aren't careful. You can see I detailed out the frog more, but I wasn't using reference, so... And I'm... <laughs> believe it or not, I don't draw frogs all the time, so... This was just in my mind's eye what I saw, but I knew the whole time there was something kind of wrong with the way that I drew his back legs. So I kind of, uh, later on, during the painting process, actually, I end up correcting that later on. And again, it, it's not always necessary to uh, for the way that I like to draw, to make things look exactly realistic, you know. I wouldn't call my style a realistic style, but at the same time I do have a sort of uh, picture in my mind that I'm trying to bring to life. comic books a lot and I just fell in love with that style. It's a good idea to start your inking session with a clean water jar. For this uh, session, I'm going to be using uh, FW Black Acrylic Ink and a Winsor & Newton Series 7 Number 2 brush. To me, there isn't really a, a rhyme or reason or a certain format for how I start inking. It's not like I always ink certain parts of the drawing as opposed to other parts of the drawing. Um, I just, I don't know, I just like to, to change it up, or I just don't really like to think in terms of formats, I guess. But. Whatever works for you, go for it. You do have to keep in mind though, uh, while you're inking line weight, as you're laying down the lines, how thick to make them, because of course inking is far less forgiving than pencil. So, um... But not too careful. There is something to be said about happy accidents. And there is a uh, wide out. I've tried all sorts of different kinds of wide out. Um, and uh, a lot of them suck, <laughs> to be honest. Um, right now, though, I'm using one that, that works pretty good. And it's... Uh, Dr. P.H. Martin's uh, Opaque White. Uh, I find that finding a wide out that's 
ha holds its opaqueness is a lot of times the issue. But uh, that brand does a pretty good job. So, as I'm going around the picture here, I am starting to uh, outline the, the shapes of things. Uh, again, not in any uh, kind of format or formulaic way. I like to put little... If you look at my art closely, a lot of times you'll see little kind of faces and, and things hidden in it. And, uh, one of the things I enjoy doing with my art. Things you wouldn't see at a first glance, but if you spend a little time with it, you'll notice them. I decided to make that background tree uh, have thicker blacks in there. Uh, gives the overall picture some contrast but again as I know I'm going to be coloring this I'm not trying to cover the whole thing in black um, the placement of blacks in any picture though is uh, pretty vital to how it's going to end up because blacks are an eye magnet. They're like an, a magnet for your eye where those thick black areas in the drawing are and uh, you have to think of you know as you look at your drawing there's like an overall um, thing that the way that the lines move the eye around the piece. As you can see here, I've switched to a micron for detailing the face. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good thing to do while you're working. If you feel you need to switch to another tool, just do it. And then I've switched back to my brush. I think I grabbed the Raphael A404 when I grabbed the brush back. Yes, doing the details on the eyes. Creating an overall uh, sort of middle gray and then in that area on the lower right side of his chin getting kind of darker in there as little drips and goo are coming out from his mouth and then going to other areas of the drawing just going back to the, the trees which need to be inked sort of palm tree falling over creating a kind of uh, silhouette or frame around the picture.
love to draw swamps and water. I just like the way the water moves. And uh, having little indications of rocks and plants going into the background and coming forward. And as uh, things recede into the background or the mist, you see less detail in those areas. The shape of these lines is creating in my mind a feeling of water flowing. Here you can see I'm actually going back in with the pencil after I've already inked a major portion of the picture. Sometimes go back with the pencil over certain areas and test it out. See if I like it. And then if I'm confident I'll move forward with the inking. And uh, now because I want the moon to feel like it's farther back in the distance, I've moved to a 01 micron for the inking and the texture detail on that. thick dry brushing to finish out the palms as well as uh, as well as the uh, hatching lines in the sky just to create a little bit of a gray tone in that area and at this point um, I'm using a kneaded eraser and I erase the entire drawing um, because I've already inked everything that I could see visually in pencil. But it's still not the final pass of inking. I'm getting all the pencil off of there, and then I'll usually go back and uh, do my final touch-ups after the erasing. So after the inking is finished, I always scan the art at 600 dpi, um, in black and white. You can scan it in color, it takes up more space, but for, for me, just scanning on black and white will do the job just fine. And then I have this inked art on file just for showing people um, what that looked like before the coloring. It's important to get acrylic inks which are transparent. Although I think some of these might be semi-transparent. But most acrylics with enough water become transparent anyway. I know I want to start off by painting in the orange sunset. Um, when you're doing traditional coloring, you really have to have a good idea up front of what you want to do. Because uh, unlike with digital coloring, uh, you can't move the hue slider and experiment. You have to know 
before you do it. What you have to have a pretty close idea of what you're going to be doing. So I usually start off by using uh, these watered down colors uh, before going in with anything that's just too heavy and saturated. That comes later. I want it to feel like a, have an ambient feel, like a, a late sunset. And now I'm going in and uh, around the edges of him, highlighting with that orangish yellow color where the light's hitting the side of his body. And I'm trying to think of every... That's usually what I do first, is uh, I think of the light. Where is the light hitting? And then I go around the entire drawing with that color, the light color, and uh, lay in in all the areas where I think the light is going to actually hit that, that object or that plant or that... Reflections in the water from the sunset color. And, uh, Gilman is green. And although the green is going to become different hues of green. I thought about this a lot. I said, well, should I make him brown? Maybe that would be more accurate in the case of a sunset. Because uh, in my mind's eye, I didn't really see him as being uh, totally brown. There would be some browns in there. But I wanted to uh, retain the green. I just felt intuitively it would have more impact. Anybody got some visine? <laughs> I didn't want the picture to feel too monochromatic, so I added uh, some purple hues and some blue. Water dripping. Now I'm starting to go in and just strengthen up some of those colors a little bit. The first light layer of color allows me to, to see it better. Okay, so now the colors are there. Now where do I want to darken them? Where do I want to saturate them? are all things I'm thinking about at this stage. And uh, you can already see what my palette's looking like here. You can use a wet palette, but I think uh, I just didn't want to get my wet palette out in this case, so I just was splodging uh, acrylic paint onto the, my regular palette. Saturating the sunset as the recedes from the light of the moon. The oranges get darker back there. You can see certain areas of Gilman become more saturated and uh, the colors are getting a little bit darker and closer to the way they will be in the final. 
And as I'm moving around the painting, I'm constantly thinking of three things in my mind. Red, yellow, and blue. You have to look at the picture and decide what... Does it need more red? Does it need more yellow? Does it need more blue? Those are the three primary colors. And they create the basis for all the colors in the world, really. Or in the color spectrum. At this point, I have very little paint in the brush. I'm almost dry brushing. I'm just trying to kill all the, the white of the paper that shouldn't be there. I left some of it on the tree because in my mind it was like little reflections of light. Reflections of light. And now as the picture is progressing, getting closer to the final. Just saturating carefully each area bit by bit with these washes of color. Having to think which areas I want more saturation. could push the saturation too far, which I think at one point I did. I thought I pushed it a little bit far because uh, acrylics actually behave differently than watercolors. They are more saturated. Putting on my 3.5 magnification goggles. do the finer details of the face. Lifting some of the color. <laughs> so here we are the part where I'm actually fixing the back legs of the frog in the painting process. After all that uh, work, I did um, add a sort of brown to the entire piece to kind of kill off a little bit of the saturation. very very light wash of that red it's because I felt looking at it that it needed more red and at this point I'm pretty much painting in details with the acrylic paint. Moved from the washes to the opaques.
even after coming this close to the completion of the final picture. After adding all that color, I wanted to go back and touch up some of the blacks that had gotten lost in the various areas of the piece. Just in the areas where I felt it needs it. I like it, the black to get lost in some areas, but in others I, I wanted to see the, the line work there. And now, it is finished. Hmm, he looks kind of wet and menacing, but he is a giant fish monster, also known as Gilman. So I'm happy with the way he turned out. Although, it would kind of suck to have a bunch of humans coming into my habitat and messing with me. So, I kind of feel for him. Put him in the finished pile. Thank you very much for joining me today. And once more, I very much enjoyed sharing with you my creative process. You know, as an artist, we have to never be too afraid or too lazy to at any point in the process make any necessary corrections in order to get the most out of what we're doing. In other words, it doesn't matter what you've already put down, if in any way it is getting in the way or would prevent a better piece of art from emanating. It must be done again or changed to reach the best possible conclusion. So, if you can see a way to make it better at any point, you have to, in a way, divorce yourself from your previous work and do whatever it takes to fix the problem or make improvement to the piece in the best way possible. Remember, it isn't finished until it's finished, until you can't see a way to make it any better. And even then, a few weeks later, or even a few months later, you might see something you want to fix. but Usually by then it's too late, and in that case, you simply take what you've learned 
and apply it to the next one. Well, if you like this video, please do remember to like, share, and subscribe and turn on the notifications bell so you won't miss any future videos. Also, for more information about me, for contact info, or if you want a commission, please see the description below. And with that, always remember, be creative.